the NFL and You Podcast. Welcome to the NFL and You Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Hayden Vassar, coming to you on uh, Friday the 13th. Uh, got a lot to get to today uh, after last night's Thursday night football game between the Bucks and the Panthers. We've got a lot of news, mostly pertaining to AFC East teams, and then we're going to get into a preview of... Uh, all the week two games going on this weekend should be a really fun slate of games, especially in the late, later time slots on Sunday. Uh, but before we get into all that, uh, I want to start first by uh, talking about last night's game between Carolina and Tampa Bay at Carolina, and it was it was a bit surprising sitting there watching that game. Uh, Buccaneers win that one, twenty four to ten. Oh, not twenty four, twenty to fourteen. My my mistake, and. It it really just felt like Tampa Bay had answers to questions Carolina didn't even know they needed to be asking. Uh, Tampa Bay's defensive philosophy the entire night was stop Christian McCaffrey and prevent him from winning the game. I I didn't know I knew that Carolina relied on Christian McCaffrey a bunch, but wow, that was. I, I didn't think they relied on him that much because apparently if you shut down Christian McCaffrey, that entire offense just stops. Uh, if you watched that game, I think you came away thinking that Todd Bowles, uh, the Buccaneers defensive coordinator, uh, still knows how to coach a defense. I know a lot of people kind of soured on him after his uh, head coaching stint with the Jets, but really watching him coach up that defense last night, they were getting good penetration against Carolina's offensive line. That wasn't always blocking extremely well. And they were getting uh, Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. If you can neutralize him in the backfield, then he doesn't become a threat. And they were forcing Cam Newton to throw the ball, throw the ball which was something he really struggled with last night. Uh, Cam Newton's final stat line, he, threw 25, he completed 25 out of 51 passes for 333 yards and lost a fumble. That's his entire stat line. He had no rushing yards, uh, completed a few rushes, no rushing yards, and completed less than half of his passes. It was not a good night for Cam Newton. Uh, struggled to hit open receivers, and just was. it really felt like he was forcing the ball in some instances. Now, I can't really attest to if the man is hurt or not. Uh, people on the NFL Network, like Michael Irvin and Steve Smith, I mean, Joe Thomas, Michael Irvin and Joe Thomas were arguing that he looks to be hurt, and they were suggesting that his ankle is still bothering him. I don't know if that's true or not, because Carolina won't say, and neither will Cam say it. Uh, he alluded to it in the press conference, but he didn't outright say that he's in pain. But you, you have to assume, watching him play, that he is not healthy. He's not 100% healthy, whether it's his ankle or it's his shoulder. Uh, something is bothering him. He's struggling to make simple throws. And while he did throw the ball downfield more in this game as compared to week one, it, it, was, it was just hard to watch. And in the first half, you could argue that his receivers weren't really stepping up. But by the end of the game, uh, Greg Olson had over 100 yards, Curtis Samuel had almost 100 yards, and DJ Moore had almost 100 yards. So it's not like the wide receivers weren't getting production. Cam was struggling. And yeah, it was a rainy game, and yeah, it was a Thursday night football, but Thursday night football game, and teams usually tend to play sloppy on Thursday nights, but if I'm a Carolina Panther fan, I would absolutely be panicking right now. You just had two straight games where Cam Newton didn't necessarily look that great, and he hasn't thrown a touchdown in either of those games. He's lost eight straight games as a starter. That's not good. Uh, they they just looked lost out there last night, and you could argue that the play calling by Nerf, North Turner was not the best. Um, I I certainly thought that, especially towards the end of the game on that last fourth down play, if you're at the fourth and half yard line, and you decide to make this really tricky gadget play, get all fancy with it, and give it to Christian McCaffrey. Now, I'm not saying don't give it to McCaffrey because he's your best offensive weapon. He is, without a doubt. But when you're that close, why get fancy with it? 
they said it numerous times on the the NFL Network last night. There was a time when Carolina would get in that situation, and they would just go smash mouth, and it was almost a guarantee that they'd get it. But those days are gone in Carolina, and I'm watching the replay of it right now, and it's just, they do all this trickery and stuff. Why not just run Cam Newton? I mean, if he's hurt, then he's hurt, but at the fourth and a half yard line, he's a 6'6", almost 250-pound quarterback. If you just QB sneak that, that's almost a guarantee he gets it. So I'm curious as to why on fourth and a half yard line with the entire game on the line, you're down by six. If you get a touchdown here, you go up by one and you force Jameis Winston to pull out a clutch drive. Why why not go smash mouth? Why are you getting tricky with it? It just didn't make any sense to me at the time. And almost 12 hours later, it still doesn't make sense. But like I said, if I'm a Carolina Panther fan, I am pressing the panic button immediately because you have lost back-to-back home games in the span of four days. It is not good in Carolina. Not good at all. Uh, But on the flip side, you really have to uh, commend the Buccaneers for the game plan they established. Their defense went out, and it was simple. Stop Christian McCaffrey. And they did that. They kept him to, I think it was below 50 rushing yards completely. That's incredible. And their offensive game plan wasn't really unique or anything. It was it was fairly simple. You know, establish a run and make sure Jameis Winston doesn't throw an interception. And he didn't. In the first half alone, if I remember correctly, he completed 13 out of his 14 passes. If I'm remembering that correctly yeah no it was 11 out of 14 for 146 yards and a touchdown to chris godwin late in the first half right before the uh halftime started Jameis winston looked really good in the first half he looked solid he wasn't you know forcing really bad throws in the second half uh, his stats kind of got away from him but that's only because uh tampa bay really pushed the running game forward with Peyton Barber and how they got their second touchdown and how they took the lead back. And you really got to commend uh, the Buccaneers offensive coordinator, Brian Leftwich, for really sticking with the running game and not letting it get out of hand. He stuck with it, and I really think that's why Tampa Bay won this game, not just because of their defense, but because they stuck with Peyton Barber in that running game in the third quarter. And Tampa Bay stole one in Carolina. This was a game that Carolina really needed, and... Now you have to question what the Panthers are doing now. You have to question Cam Newton's health. You have to question the play calling. And right now they're in tough position because if you start 0-2 in this league since 1990, you have a 12.6% chance of making the playoffs. 12.6. But it is possible because last year we had two 0-2 teams start out the season and made the playoffs, the Seahawks and the Texans. So it is doable but you have dug yourself a massive hole right now. And like I said, I think it's panic time in Carolina. They, they have some extra time because they played on Thursday night until the next game. They, they got a lot to sort out right now. And uh, things are not good in Carolina right now. All right, moving on from last Thursday night's game, we're going to get into some news. Uh, everything that's happened in the NFL since the last time we did a podcast on Tuesday. Uh, lots happened. I want to start first with... Uh, Some news from this morning, former uh, Ravens, former Ravens, 49ers, and Panthers wide receiver Torrey Smith announced his retirement from the NFL this morning. Uh, The last time uh, he was cut from the Panthers earlier this month on September 1st, and after an eight-year career, uh, he's hanging it up. Uh, Torrey played, like I said, for the Ravens. He was part of their Super Bowl championship run a couple years ago, and because he was drafted by the Ravens, and then went to the 49ers, and then most recently the Panthers. He posted a video online thanking football and God for everything he'd been given in his life. And he, he just sounded like he was at peace with what he was doing. Like I said, eight-year career, uh, 319 career catches, over 5,000 yards, and 41 touchdowns for Torrey Smith. Uh, and yeah, Torrey Smith hung it up this morning after an eight-year career in the NFL. So moving on to, I want to move to the AFC East now, which is where a massive majority of the news happened this week. And it just felt like it kept coming and coming with that division. So uh, I want to start with the Jets first. 
the Jet the Jets had a very weird week. They they started out the week. Uh, they lost wide receiver Quincy and Nunwa to the year for, to a neck injury. Uh, he's dealt with serious neck injuries in the past that have cost him this season. So they lose one of their wide receivers. So they trade a sixth round draft pick to New England, a sixth round twenty twenty one draft pick to New England to get Demarius Thomas, the low guy in the totem pole in New England, uh, to come in and play for the Jets. And it sounds like he might play Monday night. We're not quite sure yet. Uh, he's not going to practice until Saturday. And Thomas really struggled to make the wide receiver room in uh, New England. And if I remember correctly, he got cut at one point in the offseason and they brought him back. But now he's with the Jets. And then the Jets wave their kicker, Vedvik, after he missed a couple kicks in their game against Buffalo this past Sunday. And they signed a, a former Green Bay Packer kicker, Sam Finnick. And then you're thinking, okay, so the Jets had some issues and they resolved them. Until Wednesday morning when at coach, head coach Adam Gase comes out and says uh, quarterback Sam Darnold will not play Monday night because he has mono. The 23-year-old supposed savior of New York Jets football will now be out for a couple weeks because he has mono. you got to put this up there with some ridiculous stuff. I mean, I, it, it, it's truly absurd that the Jets season is basically now over because their quarterback has mono. And they said Trevor Simeon is going to come in and start Monday night. Uh, Trevor Simeon, who used to play for the Broncos. I think a couple other teams, but you're not winning games with Trevor Simeon. I hate to bust your bubble. You're just not. And the there's talk that Darnold could be good to go for like week five against the Eagles, which is right after the Jets' bye week in week four. You're asking the kid to come back from mono against a Super Bowl caliber team. And his team is more than likely going to be 0-4 at that point. It's 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 a really tough ask. We don't know if he'll be back by then. That's just a really rough estimate right now. He could be back by the bye week. He could be back after that. Initial diagnoses are saying four to six weeks. But you got to feel for Jets fans. I mean, this was rough. And I, and I saw a lot of them on Twitter talking about it and they're they're just saying this could only happen to us. This doesn't happen with other teams. And they're and you got a point, like in in the grand scheme of things, you think back the last couple of years, what have the Jets done? You remember Butt Fumble, you remember a couple of years ago when Geno Smith was their quarterback and he got his jaw broken in the locker room right before the season started because he got into an argument with a linebacker. And now Sam Darnold has mono and it's basically derailed their season. Like like, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's it's so absurd. And you feel for Jets fans because their season's basically derailed the moment it left the station. And I know I said the Panthers should be hitting the panic button. The Jets should be hitting the panic button right now as well. It's just, yeah, I think their season's over right now. I'm sorry. Because by the time Sam Darnold comes back, you're basically going to have to ask him to be perfect for the rest of the season to give your team a chance to potentially make the postseason. And I think that's too much of an ask right now for that young man. But, oh, man, the Jet, the Jets are in trouble right now. <laughs> the Jets are in trouble. And if a game Monday night against Cleveland, uh, I, I don't know what they're going to do. Trevor Simeon has to right the ship somehow. So we'll see what he can do. Uh, staying in the AFC East, I want to quickly talk about New England and Antonio Brown. If you haven't heard, on Tuesday... Uh, a civil lawsuit was filed against Antonio Brown for uh, sexual assault against a former trainer of his uh, while he was still at Central Michigan University. Uh, Brown admitted that he did know this woman and uh, he says that they had a sexual relationship at one point. But as of right now, the lawsuit states that Brown assaulted this woman three separate times and the NFL has announced they're investigating it. Uh, Ian Rappaport reported that the, neither the Patriots nor the NFL knew about any of this. Uh, it's a it's come out that Brown and his agent knew about it, but nobody in the NFL knew about it. Uh, there was a really testy press conference the next day with Bill Belichick, 
where he really gave reporters the cold shoulder about this and that that we've gotten used to that kind of stuff from Bill when it comes to like, you know, Patriots lost a tough game and he's just going to go we're on to Cincinnati, stuff like that, but this is not the time to just give the cold shoulder when you have a player accused of sexual assault on your team. This is not the time to be doing something like that, Bill. And it sounds like he's going to play. The NFL, it sounds like he's not going to place him on the exempt list before the Sunday. And it sounds like he's going to play. He's been at practice. Uh, there's been no talk from the Patriots about anything. They just said they're going to cooperate with the investigation. Um, now we just have to wait and see what happens. Uh, the NFL, I think if I remember correctly, it was reported that the woman who accused Brown is going to be meeting with the NFL uh, this coming week. So we'll see what happens with that. But right now we're just going to wait for the NFL to investigate and see what they say. And I'm going to be honest, from past experiences with NFL investigations, from Kareem Hunt to Josh Brown to Ray Rice, the NFL has a tendency to botch these investigations horrifically. No matter what it's about, even if it's about sexual assault or domestic violence, the NFL will botch this investigation and everybody's going to be mad over it. Um, if it comes out that Antonio Brown did indeed do this, he should be immediately ejected from the league and brought in a prison cell for the rest of his life. I know it's not a real criminal court case. It's a civil suit case, so it's going to be different. It's not really, I know it's not going to really determine guilt. It's not going to be like, if it comes out, he did this, he gets jail time from this court case. It's a civil suit. But if it comes out that Antonio Brown did indeed do this, he deserves to rot in a cell for the rest of his life. And I wish people would treat this the same way they treated him when he left the Raiders. You remember the days and days of people just spewing venom and vinegar about how dare he could do something like this. And it really just feels like they went quiet the moment this hit the news waves. Like, everybody just kind of went quiet. It's like... Now you actually have him accused of committing an actual crime. And everybody just goes quiet about it. it, it it's really odd to me. So like I said, uh, Antonio Brown stands accused of sexual assault. And it sounds like he's going to be playing uh, Sunday. Uh, and we'll just see what happens from here. We'll just keep you updated on the story as it develops. Uh, moving on to the AFC West. Uh, Chargers tight end. Hunter Henry suffered a tibia plateau fracture in his knee and it sounds like he's going to miss about a month from the team which is a big blow to a really good player hunter henry missed all of last season if i remember correctly with a torn acl and now he's going to miss about another month or maybe more because of this and the chargers are a bit banged up right now uh i know their kicker situation is a bit flippy floppy uh they got i think a place kicker currently doing field goal duties there it's going to be interesting to see what they look like against the Lions on Sunday. And lastly, uh, I want to mention in the NFC East, Eagles defensive tackle Malik Jackson is out for the season after a lens frantic injury, which, if I remember correctly, has to do something with the legs. Uh, Malik Jackson, uh, starting defensive tackle for the Eagles. And the Eagles have been vaunted for a couple years for having really good depth on both the defensive and offensive lines. But having Malik out is really going to test them a bit. Uh, they've signed Akeem Spence to come in and replace them. Spence played, uh, no, Spence started all 16 games for the Dolphins last year. This is a tough blow for Malik. Uh, he signed a $30 million three year uh, contract in the offseason with the Eagles, and it's just a really tough blow to have that happen in the first game of the season. Once again, Malik Jackson starting defensive tackle for the Eagles, now out for the season. And that's it for news right now. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, previews for every Week 2 game, starting with the early 1 o'clock games, and then moving into the primetime games, and as such, you get to drift. Uh, like we did last week, we're gonna I'm going to give you a couple things in each game to really look for or think about. I'm going to give my pick for each game, and then throughout this I'm going to give you three games that I think are going to be the most interesting to watch this weekend. All right, starting first, we're going to give you the 49ers at the Bengals. 
I really, I'm really interested to see what Cincinnati looks like. I was really, really impressed with what they put on the field in uh, Seattle last week. Uh, I hope it isn't just a week one mirage, you know, where a team looks really good week one and then they're never, ever that good again. Uh, maybe the Andy Dalton, Zach Taylor marriage is a lot better than we all thought. I mean, the Bengals looked great and they probably should have won that game in Seattle, but they didn't. They came up short towards the end. But now they got a 49ers defense traveling all the way all the way to the East Coast to play in an early morning game for them. So maybe they can catch the 49ers sleeping a little bit. I still have a lot of concerns about the 49ers offense, especially Jimmy G. He did not look crisp or clean last week. He had some good passes here and there, but mostly not good passes. Uh, and we'll see how good that 49ers defense was. They forced a lot of turnovers against Jameis Winston last week. I know it's Jameis Winston, and he leads the league in turnovers since 2015 with 79, but I, re I really want to see if Cincinnati was more than just a week one light show. I'm not asking them to throw for over 400 passing yards again or for John Ross to have almost 200 receiving yards again, but just be entertaining. Be watchable. That's all I'm asking for. Uh, if I really think of the Bengals put forth at least almost half the effort they gave in that Seattle game. I think they win this game. That's why I'm taking the Bengals at home to beat the 49ers. All right, moving on. We've got Bills at Giants next. Uh, Bills playing in the stadium for the second week in a row because they played at the Jets last week. And if you n don't know, the Jets and Giants share a stadium. So the Bills basically playing in the same stadium two weeks in a row. And they're, and they're getting a, a very uh, sloppy Giants team right now. That defense is not good. It'll be interesting to see if Eli Manning can still look serviceable. He had a, I, still, I will argue that he had a good week against Dallas last week, even though the game got away from them. Because Eli was not the problem in that game. It's their horrific defense that's the problem. But Giants fans aren't really going to care about that. They care about winning. And they look at the backup, Daniel Jones, and think that he can win now. I don't really think he can, especially with that team. But I think the Bills have a stingy defense. And I think the key to this for the Bills to win is to use Josh Allen and his mobility. His mobility is sneaky effective. I'm telling you, he doesn't look like a guy that can rip it and run, but he can. I think that could really throw this very... Uh, not good Giants defense off, and I think that the Bills offense will keep them in flux if they keep Josh Allen mobile. But the key for the Giants to find success, they have to feed Saquon Barkley. He had 15 touches against the Cowboys. Saquon Barkley is the mo one of the, you could argue he's the most dynamic player in the entire league. You don't give the most dynamic player only 15 touches. You just don't. And I understand that they were down big early, but still, you got to give him more than that. You have to feed that man. So either it's running or with receiving, get him touches. That's how the Giants stay in this game. But like I said, I think Josh Allen's mobility, if the Bills use it effectively, will keep the that Giants defense off balance. And I think the Bills take this one. And the Giants are going to start 0-2, which is only going to increase the calls for Daniel Jones to start, even if Eli plays well. I could really think Eli plays well and he still gets benched for Daniel Jones. That's sad because Eli looked great last week, whether people want to talk about it or not. All right, moving on, we got Cardinals at Ravens. This one, this one could be sneaky interesting. I, I don't know what to make of the Cardinals yet because for the most part of their first game, their offense was horrific. Through the entire, through the majority of their game until the fourth quarter, so quarters one through three. Kyler Murray had 70 total passing yards in that game against Detroit. 70 total passing yards. That's horrifically bad. But then in the fourth quarter, everything changed. They score 18 unanswered, take it to overtime, and end in a tie. So I still don't know what to make of the Kyler Murray and Cliff Kingsbury experience yet. But we might get a bit of a scoring show when they match up against uh, Baltimore in that new look offense. Baltimore, just a heads up, people. Baltimore is not going to score 59 points and have over 600 total yards every single week. They're just not. You can't do that. Nobody can do that. 
It's not a knock on Baltimore or anything, but I'm interested to see uh, if Baltimore's offense can continue to be productive and push the ball downfield and keep Lamar Jackson looking great. Because I'm going to be honest, I'm really enjoying all the shade Lamar Jackson's been throwing towards people who said he should probably switch positions. It's been fantastic. I love it. Cough, cough, Bill Poley and cough, cough. I just want to see if Baltimore is can still be capable of airing it out and not just be a run-heavy team. That's what I want to see. I want to see if it's more of a, if it's not just a mirage that Miami didn't put a safety back deep which they didn't do on a lot of those big plays that Baltimore was scoring on. But I think Baltimore's offense is ready to win now. I think Kyler Murray and the Cardinals are still figuring things out offensively. I'm really not sold on the Cardinals' defense. That's why I'm taking Baltimore to win this. But don't be surprised if you see a high-scoring affair here. That's all I'm going to say. I'm Once again, I'm going to take Baltimore to win this, but I, it might be sneaky entertaining. Maybe. Or maybe Baltimore blows them out and Cardinals have a horrific offensive week again. We don't know. We'll see. All right, moving on. We've got Chargers at Lions. Another uh, California team going to the East Coast for an early kickoff. And if I'm the Lions, this is the perfect time to be playing L.A. You get them coming to your house in a very early game. And they're a bit banged up. Like I said, they don't have Hunter Henry. They got some kicker situation, and they have some injuries on that defense. This is the perfect time to be playing uh, the Chargers. But on the flip side, you got to wonder, is Detroit hanging off of the hangover of the tie that they were they went through with the Cardinals? Because for the most part, Detroit played like they should have won that game if you exclude the fourth quarter in overtime. Detroit's defense is supposed to be better than that. They have a solid tight end in TJ Hawkinson, who had over 130 yards in his rookie debut. And the the Lions just aren't supposed to blow games like that. They're supposed to have a solid defense with a strong running game that can run out the clock. Neither of those things showed up last week. Their defense let them score 18 points in the fourth quarter, and their running game was not that great. Carryon Johnson was supposed to be a bell cow for them, and it just wasn't there last week. Which is odd because they were up for the majority of that game, so you'd think they would be running the ball more to run out the clock. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what the Lions look like this week. Uh, I have a feeling, because I live in Michigan, I think the Lions might come out just completely flat in this game, just still defeated from last week. And I'm going to take the Chargers to win this, but it might be a very low-scoring game early on. Might make some people look at it funny, but I've got I've got the Chargers winning this one. I just can't believe in the Lions. I just can't. They they have a tendency to underperform against teams they should win, and then they overperform against teams they shouldn't be performing well against. It's such an odd thing, but that's just who the Lions are. I mean, remember, they beat the Patriots last year. Not only did they beat the Patriots last year, they overwhelmingly destroyed the Patriots last year. And then they went on to have a six-win season. So it's 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 odd. They'll do a great performance one week, and then they're going to be completely flat the next. I think the Lions are probably going to come out flat. And I've got the Chargers winning this one. All right, moving on to an AFC South match. The Colts at the Titans. So, here we are. Colts... Had a game they probably should have won against the Chargers. And they're starting out at 0-1. And then the Titans are coming off a 30-point uh, beatdown of the Browns. And they're going to Tennessee to play. Now, for the most part of this rivalry's history, the the Colts have owned this rivalry. Uh, the Titans never beat Andrew Luck. And if I remember correctly, it was like 12 straight wins for Andrew Luck against the Titans. But in 2017, the one year Luck didn't play, when Jacoby Brissett was the quarterback, the Titans beat the Colts twice. So Jacoby's never beaten the Tennessee Titans, and he gets a chance to do it this weekend. Uh, I really was impressed with the Colts last week. I thought they really hung in there, and they probably should have won that game against uh, the Chargers. If it wasn't for Vinatieri missing a couple kicks, they probably would have won it in regulation. Um, Vinatieri sounds like he's going to stay on the roster, but if anybody has proven that they deserve the benefit of the doubt over 24 years, it's Adam Vinatieri. 
dude's going to be a Hall of Famer one day. So I understand that the Colts are going to give him a second shot, but if he comes out and shanks a couple kicks that probably decide the game, he might be out of a job by the end of the weekend. Uh, I really don't believe in the Tennessee Titans offense. I'm just going to be blunt about it. I don't believe in it. Outside of Derrick Henry, I just don't. Marcus Mariota is kind of in the same boat. I know I mentioned this last week as Jameis Winston, that he's never really evolved as a quarterback, and you can blame that on constant coach overturn and offense coordinators constantly coming in and leaving. If I remember correctly, there were times where he had a new coordinator almost every single season. But it's getting to the point where you need to decide if you're going to keep this guy going forward or get rid of him. And you have Ryan Tannehill as the backup. And I know I mentioned this last week. But the thing with Marcus Mariota and the Titans, they'll have a game like what they did against the Browns where they come out very impressive and they look great and people are going to look at them and they're like, okay, maybe the Titans got something. And then they come out the next week and lose by 15. That's just something the Titans have done over the last couple of years. It just is, like it or not. And this feels like a game that the Titans would come out after winning by 30 last week and lose by 15. It just feels like it. It feels like I'm watching the same movie over and over and over again. I will argue, though, that the Tennessee defense, especially the defensive line, looks very stout. And it'll be interesting to watch the defensive line go up against uh, the Colts' offensive line, which is arguably one of the best in the league, and I don't think it gets enough credit. Especially their guard, Quentin Nelson, who killed one of the Chargers' defenders last week with one of the most brutal pancake blocks so far in the league. I really like the Tennessee defense. I just am not sold on their offense. And you look at the Colts, you you hope Jacoby Brissett can equal what he did last week. While he wasn't great, he also just gave them a chance to win. And right now, that's all you can really ask for from him. Uh, so, can Jacoby look solid again? Can he post another 100 passer rating game again? If I remember correctly, he had 198 yards passing, but he still gave them a chance to win. He drove them down late in the game against the Chargers and gave them the clutch touchdown to tie the game. And if he can do perform that well again, I, I think the Colts can win this. And that's why I got the Colts winning against the Titans. I want the Titans to look good consistently. I know I've seen them over the last couple of years just win a game and then drop a game or two and look horrifically bad and then they'll come back and look good again. The Titans are too inconsistent for me, and I need them to look consistently good. Uh, so like I said, I got the Colts winning this one. And moving on to the other a- a- uh, AFC South matchup for the early morning, you got Jags at Texans. You got the Texans coming off of a brutal, heartbreaking loss in Monday Night Football where Deshaun Watson literally gave his heart, body, and soul to win that game. And Will Lutz kicks a game winner and the Saints win. Then on the other side, you got the Jags, who are starting Gardner Minshew the second in his first career start. By the way, interesting though, Gardner Minshew the second, there's some reporters digging into that family history. They can't find a Gardner Minshew the first. His dad's not named Gardner, Min- Gardner Minshew. His grandfather's not named Gardner Minshew. So why is this young man called Gardner Minshew the second? It is it is quite the legend. Yes, Gardner Minshew the second. Now, speaking of Minshew, he had a very, very impressive debut in a 40-24 to 24 loss, if you can have an impressive debut in a blowout loss, against the Chiefs where he completed most of his passes, threw a touchdown, and he looked really great in relief. And he gave the Jaguars just a little glimmer of hope that maybe they aren't out of this. But you really have to remember... It's different when you're coming in in relief in the middle of a game than when a team has an entire week to prep for you. Now, from multiple reporters who were at the Jags game, it sounds like Minshew was really comfortable with the playbook and he knows what he likes and the coaches know what he likes. And that's a good thing to know. But once again, it's different when you're coming in right off the bench and a team hasn't prepped for you and they haven't done study and they haven't taken an entire week to try and prep to stop you like the Texans are going to. I'm not saying Gardner Minshew's going to fall flat on his face, but if he but if he has a less than stellar performance, that's probably why because the Texans spent all week prepping for him. Uh 
Speaking of quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson, on the other hand, an uh, interesting note about his career record. In regular season games, Deshaun Watson is 14-9. and nine. All nine of those losses have come by one possession, which means he's kept them in games, which is exactly what you want from a quarterback. He gives you a chance to win, and that's all you could ever ask for him, from him. But sitting there and watching that game against New Orleans... The Texans have to do a better job of protecting Deshaun Watson. They just have to. It is criminal that he's been getting hit so much. He had six sacks against him in the New Orleans game. And yeah, some of them you could argue were on him. But my God, he's running on almost every play. They need like six Laramie Tunsils out there to block for him. It's, it's horrendous how bad that offensive line can be. And if they want to win and win consistently in the league, they have to do a better job of protecting him. But I just don't know that they can. I don't believe in that Texans offensive line. And as a result, I don't really believe in the Texans, even though I love Deshaun Watson and I love DeAndre Hopkins. I think their wide receiver core is a little bit underrated. Will Fuller is a great deep threat, and they got Kenny Stills and Kiki QT. Uh, as the four-string wide receiver, is a really nice combo. It's just, I don't believe in that offensive line to give him enough time to protect him. Uh, Like I said, the Texans have to protect Watson. But interesting note about the Jags offense, Leonard Fournette has not had a 100-yard rush game since the 2017 divisional round playoff game against the Steelers. If the Jags and Gardner Minshew are going to win this game, Leonard Fournette has to help out. He has to. Because they really need him to step up and really take the pressure off of Minshew where Minshew's not having to do everything himself. And you would hope to see J.J. Watt, if you're a Texans fan, uh, do more than he did in the last game. You could argue in his last game, that was his worst game in his career. He had no hits. no He didn't really do anything. And you could argue that might be a result of them trading away Jadavion Clowney, so now teams can really focus in on J.J. Watt. Uh, If J.J. can get in there and get pressure in the young quarterback's face, it might be a difference maker in this game. This game is really a toss-up in my opinion. I don't really feel high up about either of these teams. But I'm going to take the Texans to win it. I just think Gardner Minshew... Might not have the best day possible in his first career start. I'm not saying he's a bad kid. I hope the best for him, but I just think he's going to have a bit of a rough day as compared to his stellar start last week. All right, moving on to Pats at Dolphins. This is going to be the worst game of the weekend. The The Patriots might seriously score 70 points here. I had a thought earlier in the week of, what if I did a new segment where I guaranteed at least one game result where, like, I say, this is exactly what's going to happen in this game, and I guarantee it. But then I realized I would be picking, I would be guaranteeing that the Dolphins lose every single weekend. And that's really not fun. That's not. It gets repetitive after a while. But uh, the Dolphins are not in good shape right now. And there was a report earlier, I mean, last night, if I remember correctly, it was either last night or this morning, where. uh, They're one of their star, one of their few star players remaining, Minka Fitzpatrick who they took in the first round about a year ago was granted permission to seek a trade because he doesn't like how he's being used in the defense. And he probably doesn't like that the team's going to be tanking. He doesn't like the fact that they're going to lose by 50 every week. That's understandable. So Minka Fitzpatrick and his agent have been granted uh, permission to seek a trade. Uh, And if you've looked at his stats so far in his career and he's still on his rookie deal, Minka Fitzpatrick is a solid defensive player. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets traded sometime soon, and if a team does, what they give up for him. But once again, New England might seriously put up 70 points. The Dolphins are not in good shape right now. But weird things have happened in Miami. Uh, So far since he became the head coach of the Patriots, Bill Belichick is 8-11 with the Patriots in Miami since he took over as head coach. That's wild. That's crazy. It's just weird and wacky things happen in Miami, and it's so odd. Anyway, 
I'm gonna keep this one short because I think the Pats win, but this this one might get uglier even sooner than the Ravens game against the Dolphins did. It's gonna get ugly fast. And I got the Pats winning big. Oh, the Dolphins are bad right now. Just remember that pain, Dolphins fans, when you got the first overall pick and you're taking Justin Herbert or Tua Tagovailoa. Just remember this pain. It'll be worth it. All right, moving on to our first main watch game of the weekend, a game that I think is going to be really exciting. you got Seahawks at Steelers. Uh, this, this game should be fun to watch. Uh, Steelers need to come out and show that their offense has some teeth. I know they played against the Patriots, and the Patriots make everyone look stupid. But you can't really just say, oh, the Steelers will be fine. Because everybody said that last season. Oh, they'll be fine. They'll make the playoffs. Don't worry about it. And then they end up missing the playoffs. So it's not just all fine and dandy in Pittsburgh. They need to show that they can still come out and be Big Ben and put up points. Because if you take them for granted like the Steelers did last season, you miss the playoffs. Uh, It's another... West Coast team traveling to an early East Coast kickoff on the other side of the country. And like I mentioned with the Steelers, the Seahawks offense also looked rusty. Russell Wilson did not have a good passing performance. I know it was raining a lot in Seattle last week, but you hope to see more from them. I know that they're a run-first offense, so they're not really going to be pass-heavy, but still. But this should be a very slow, back-and-forth, heavyweight fight. I want to see... It might even be a running showcase with James Conner and Chris Carson of the Seahawks just going right at it for four straight quarters. But I know I mentioned this earlier about teams that start 0-2. And since the Seahawks won last week, if the Steelers drop this game, they're in trouble. They're in trouble because the Ravens look like they're going to be racking off wins quickly. And the Steelers are going to have to keep pace with that. But remember, earlier since 1990, only 12.6% of teams that start 0-2 make the playoffs. So the Steelers really need a win here. And for the Seahawks, if they just need to show that their offense is working fine. They, they had the scare with Cincinnati where they almost dropped that game at home. But to, to show that Russell Wilson in the passing game is working, I have faith in your running game and your defense, but... To show that Russell Wilson and the and the wide receivers still have it, uh, but I'm gonna take the Steelers in this one. I I usually think that the Steelers do well in bounce back games after their offense doesn't perform well, and I'll take the Steelers at home in this one. But I do think it'll be a very close game and come down to the wire and be a very fun watch early in the morning, at one o'clock Eastern. All right, next up you got Vikings at Packers. This is gonna be all right. If you don't like points, fine. If you like slow defensive football. This is the game for you. I think the Packers defense is going to be really good this year, and the Vikings defense is going to be really good this year. Uh, and what does that mean? It means this game is going to feature a lot of runs. We know that the Vikings love to run it with Mike Zimmer and Gary Kubiak. They just love to run it. That's their thing. And this matchup is going to be indicative of that. And the Packers and Matt LaFleur, they want to establish the run. That's going to be their thing going forward this season. So this matchup is almost perfect for both these teams Uh, in Green Bay, but it just just feels like it's going to be defensive heavy and a lot of runs. Neither quarterback is probably going to put up a lot of points. Uh, The Packers have an extra couple days to prepare for this game uh, because they played an opening night kickoff, so they had an extra couple days to prepare, see how much that factors in, see if they've worked out some kinks in that offense because it still looked like they were struggling a bit in the Chicago game. But I really think this is going to be a very low-scoring game. There won't be a lot of offense. These defenses are going to clamp down early and often on these two teams. But I got the Vikings winning this one. Remember last year in Week 2, Vikings went to Green Bay, and they almost pulled it off, but it ended up in a tie in overtime. I really think this is going to be a low-scoring defensive game. Combined score might be 20 points. Like I'm talking that low-scoring. It's it's gonna it's gonna be very defensive heavy football, probably really hard hitting, and I got the Vikings winning this one. I really believe in the Vikings. I really think they win the NFC North this year. All right, moving on to the last one o'clock Eastern kickoff game. Uh, 
Cowboys at Washington. Uh, Adrian Peterson just got named the starter again in Washington. Uh, Darius Geis is now uh, out indefinitely because of a meniscus injury. He had surgery just the other day on it. Uh, we see more run production now out of Washington because their run production really wasn't there last week. And they were trying to protect the lead. Their offense just became dead in the second half. I think in the third quarter they had like almost 30 total yards trying to protect a lead against Philadelphia. I, you could argue that the game wasn't Case Keenan's fault because he put up great numbers, especially in the first half. Just in the second half, they just had no answer. And Philadelphia bled the clock with long drives. But uh, Case Keenum, the starting quarterback in Washington, has lost five straight starts dating back to Week 14 last year. And I think it's going to be six straight losses. I think Dallas takes this one, and probably handily. Uh, you got to wonder for the Dallas offense, is he going to be more involved? He wasn't really involved last week probably because he missed so much time because of his holdout. And Dallas was a lot more pass-heavy. See how uh, see how much involved Zeke gets this week. And does Dallas have a complete team? Their defense is stout. They got talent all across the board. And now that their offense looks like it's finally out of the 50s, I meant 1950s. Yeah, 1950s offense they were running these past couple of years with Scott Linehan. You can argue that the Cowboys might be a complete team. Their offensive game is dangerous now. They're throwing the ball downfield more, which is something they haven't really done since Tony Romo was there. And their wide receivers are getting open, which is something that they haven't done in a long time. The Cowboys look dangerous, and I want to see if they can take that offensive show on the road and still have success. They don't have to, you know, throw for over 400 yards like they did against the Giants, but just show that you can still get wide receivers open you could still throw downfield. And the, the longer Dak Prescott goes and performs well like he did last week, the harder it's going to be to sign him to a new contract. Jerry Jones has to get that contract done as soon as possible. Because if we're like six games into the season and the Cowboys have only lost one game and Dak Prescott is still balling out like this, his price value is only going to go up and up and up and up and up. But like I said, I think the Cowboys win this. And you have to argue if another lost and the red and the Washington football team starts at 0 and 2. How hot is uh Jay Gruden's seat? There were a lot of whispers in the offseason that this really could be his last year and if they start out slow, 0 and 2 slow, he he could probably be gone before the season's even halfway over. I, I really think he's probably gonna be the first coach to go. And you never want to see a guy lose his job, but I think Jay Gruden's time in Washington's coming to an end. All right, moving on into our 4 o'clock Eastern games. First one up, Chiefs at Raiders. Raiders played inspired football Monday night. They really did. They've had a complete game. Uh, their offensive game plan was simple. Get rid of the ball quickly to neutralize the pass rush, and it worked to perfection. Their offensive line did great blocking. They held the Broncos to zero QB hits. With all of the talent on that defense and Vic Fangio coaching them up, they held them to zero QB hits on Carr. That's phenomenal. Any coach across the league would take that. But now you have to ask, bit of a short week because they played on Monday night, how feisty are the Raiders going to be? Uh, they got Chris Conley maybe coming back. Uh, if you remember correct, if you remember back during the Monday night game, he was the player that got carted off due to a neck injury. Very scary scene, and it sounds like he might be good to go for this game. And that's great for the Raiders' defense because they're going to need all the help they can get against this Chiefs offense. Uh, yeah, you just have to wonder how feisty the Raiders are going to be going forward. I just, I just can't bet against the Chiefs. Like I said last week, the Chiefs are probably going to be a team that hangs forty points on everybody. Uh it'll be interesting to see how healthy Patrick Mahomes is. Is he moving around with that ankle injury? Is he having trouble planting the foot and throwing? It'll just be interesting to watch him and Sammy Watkins as well with Tyreek Hill out. Uh, how good is Sammy Watkins going to play? Because he's probably not going to do what he did last week every week. He's not going to have almost 200 receiving yards and three touchdowns every single week. He's just not. But he still has to be productive. So it'll be interesting to see if he can continue to have success because that's been a major critique of Watkins' his entire career is that he'll have a game like he did last weekend 
where he looks great and phenomenal and looks well worth everything everybody's hyped him up to be. And then he just disappears for a week or two and has maybe 30 total yards. So Sammy Watkins has to continue to step up. It'll be interesting to see how healthy Mahomes is. I got the Chiefs in this one. Uh, I I just can't bet against them. I just can't. I just think they're too good right now, and they're going to go to the AFC Championship game again. I just can't bet against them. Moving on to another defensive heavy matchup, Bears at Broncos. Ooh, a Vic Fangio revenge game. Oh boy. Uh, like I just mentioned with the Chief, with I mean with the Raiders, the Broncos got zero quarterback hits Monday night. That defense is too talented to do that. They got talent everywhere, all across that defense. And Vic Fangio is a defensive mastermind. But I wonder now because Vic Fangio has been coaching in this league for decades, but he's always coached from the skybox up there with all the other coordinators. But now that he's a head coach, he has to be down on the field. You got to wonder if this change in vision of how he sees the game is affecting any of the defense. And I think it's a fair question to ask. And if the Bears come out and go up and down the field on the Broncos defense like the Raiders did, it's a very fair question to ask. Uh, we haven't seen the Bears since the opening night game where their offense looked incredibly rusty and Mitchell Trubisky gets booed off the field. So we'll see if the Bears have found cohesion on the offense or if it's still very rusty. Uh, I'm going to be honest with the Broncos offense. I don't trust Joe Flacco. I just don't. I, he, I just don't trust him to make big-time throws to score a lot of points. That Broncos offense is not built to score a lot of points. That offense, ever since John Elway's been there, has been built to do just enough and let the defense win the game. You score 17 and that defense will hold them to 14. And if I remember correctly, the Broncos have averaged 17 points a game the last couple seasons. So it's not like it's just a this year thing. It's been a thing the last couple years where the Broncos offense has not been productive. I just don't trust the Broncos to score a lot of points, and the Bears' defense looks good. And I'm going to trust Matt Nagy to have that offense more working, and I still think the Broncos are still working on things, especially offensively. And I'm going to take the Bears to win this one. I go in the mile high and get a win. The Vic Fangio revenge game. Uh, now I got the Bears in this one. Now moving on, this is the game of the weekend right here. This is the game of the weekend. Saints at Rams. Uh, These two teams played twice last year. Each one was an instant classic. And as soon as the schedule was announced, I guarantee you the Saints circled this one with a red marker. They they want this game badly. There was a lot of chirping in the offseason about these two teams, especially players from each one talking trash to each other. But this one's going to be fun. Uh... Saints offense and defense really found its groove in the second half of the game against Houston. They were rusty at first, but Drew Brees really found his rhythm, especially late in the game, that uh, clutch fourth-quarter drive to get into field goal range. Uh, But on the flip side, I think the Rams are still just a tad bit rusty on offense. They still have questions, especially of how they're going to manage Todd Gurley. Are they still going to be splitting reps? Uh, The well-oiled machine might just be a tad bit rusty. And I think it's going to be a very chippy, chippy game. These two teams do not like each other. The Saints feel like they were robbed, and rightfully so, after what happened last season. And it's it's going to be chippy, and it's going to be very physical. I'm telling you guys, if you only watch one game this weekend, make it this one. It's gonna This game is probably going to come down to one or two plays that decide it. And I've got the Saints walking into L.A. and winning this one. I think the Saints get revenge, and they win it probably off of a late field goal again by Will Lutz. Uh, Yeah, i got the Saints winning this one. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I honestly can't wait for this game. All right, now we're going to move into Sunday night prime time. Eagles at Falcons. This game should be good. Falcons are coming off a horrific loss where their offense did absolutely nothing against the Vikings defense. And the Falcons are just too good offensively with Matt Ryan and Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley. They're just too good to have a game like that. 
And the last two times that they played the Eagles, uh, going back to the to the Eagles Super Bowl run, they played them in the divisional round and should have won that game. And then last year, the season opener, they played in Philadelphia again, and it came down to Julio on fourth and goal, not making the catch. So these two teams have a track record of playing really, really close, tight, physical games. And I think that's going to be what we get again Sunday night. Uh, if the Falcons start 0-2, because remember, they lost last week, and if the Falcons start 0-2, how hot is Dan Quinn's seat? I mentioned it last week that they fired a bunch of uh, coordinators during the offseason. And like I said, that's a move that usually happens right before a coach gets fired, a head coach gets fired, because then he's then he goes, the pressure's all on me now, and if they start slow again, and they have another abysmal season like they had last season, he might get fired. That's crazy to think, because the Falcons were in the Super Bowl just a few years ago, but they really need this win. The Falcons need this game to avoid starting 0-2. Uh... I, I just think the Eagles are too good. I think the Eagles are going to overwhelm them on both sides of the ball. But you got to wonder, are the Eagles going to start slow again like they did against Washington? Is it going to be a case of they don't really show up in the first half and then come back in the second half? You want to see the Eagles play a complete game. You want to see them play full four quarters, not just the last two and pull it out in the fourth quarter. Uh, but I got the Eagles winning this one on Sunday Night Football. I just think they're too good, and like I said, I think the Eagles are probably going to win the NFC East. But it's going to be a fun, chippy matchup on Sunday night. It should be a lot better than the game we got last week. All right, last but not least, we got the Monday night game, Browns and Jets. I was kind of looking forward to this one before Sam Darnold got mono. Uh, I, I still can't believe that. That's so stupid. The kind of quarterback who's got mono. <laughs> That's so stupid. Uh, but if the Jets don't have Darnold, then they have no chance. I know the Browns looked horrifically sloppy, and I know their offensive line really can't block right now. But the Jets have Trevor si- Trevor Simeon at quarterback. That's all that really needs to be said about this game. Uh, like we mentioned to Marius Thomas earlier in the show, uh, get straight into the Jets. How much will he play? Uh, Monday night, uh, the Browns need this win. Both teams really need this win. The Jets' season is basically over with Darnold out. Browns need this win because if you go 0 and 2 to the start of this Browns season, things are going to get volatile very fast. I still think the Browns need to gel a bit more offensively uh, before they can really start winning games. Uh, their offensive line absolutely needs to block more. Uh, Baker Mayfield did hurt his hand last week against the Titans. He says it's fine. It's just a bruise, but he was in a lot of pain. And they need to do a better job of blocking. And I do like the Jets' defense, but without, like I said, Sam Darnold and Trevor Simeon calling the plays, I just don't I don't trust them to win. I don't. I think they lose every game that Simeon starts for them over the next couple weeks. And we're seeing some jabs thrown by uh, Odell Beckham Jr. towards Greg Williams. Uh, says that Greg Williams teaches cheap shots and dirty hits by his players. Which sounds like a really bad jab when on the surface. But when you think about it, Greg Williams was the guy behind Bounty Gate in New Orleans. So if a player says he's teaching them dirty hits, I, I'm, I'm going to be inclined to believe him. And you got to remember, uh, Brown uh, Odell suffered a ankle injury against a Greg Williams coach defense in the 2017 preseason, and that cost Odell a lot of playing time. So this game might get chippy. I really think it might get chippy between these two teams. I've got the Browns winning, and it's probably going to be very sloppy football. But I got the Browns winning this one. I just don't believe in the Jets with Trevor Simeon. I just don't. I really think their season's over without Sam Darnold at the quarterback position, and they probably lose every game without him. But I got the Browns winning this one. All right, that's it for every Week 2 game. Uh, We're going to be back Tuesday to recap everything that happened over the weekend and any news. Uh, And on Tuesday, we're also going to do a little segment after we recap every game. 
where we tell you should your team be panicking. I know we did a little bit of that today with the Jets and the Panthers. But after week two, you start to get more of a sense of where teams are starting to head. That's why you don't really do it after week one. Week two or three is right when you should really be looking at if teams should be panicking. And that's what we're going to do on Tuesday. We're going to go through every game, recap everything, get you the news, and tell you if your team should or shouldn't be panicking. And a preview piece, here you go. Jets and Panthers should absolutely be panicking. You should be hitting the panic button so hard that it's broken. All right. Thanks for joining uh, the Friday podcast. Uh, Hope you enjoyed this weekend's slate of games. Uh, Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, Social media details in the description box down below. And like I said, be looking to see a panic button preview show on Tuesday. All right. Thanks for coming by. Have a good weekend.